everyone, and welcome to another episode of Grit and Glamour, an interview series featuring honest conversations with fashion change makers on what it really takes to lead and succeed. I'm your host, Ruby Veridiano, and on today's show, I have Anya Lim, the founder and managing director of fashion social enterprise Ant Hill, which is based in the Philippines. Uh, to, on today's conversation, we're going to be talking about how companies and brands can co-create with artisans ethically, respectfully, and responsibly. Anya has been in her field for over a decade and started off as a volunteer with international nonprofits and then got her master's in communications for social change at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, she is passionate about women's economic empowerment, specifically in the weaving and weaving communities and traditional uh, tradition handicraft spaces. So without further ado, let's bring Anya on the show. Anya, hello and how are you? Thanks for having me, Ruby. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your story. You have, I know that you have an expertise in this subject. You've been doing this work for a while now. And maybe you could we could start off by you telling us a little bit more about your company, Ant Hill, what your mission is, and what you provide. Right. So um, Ant Hill is actually a very long acronym. So we Filipinos love our acronyms. <laughs> it is Alternative Nest and Trading or Training Hub for Indigenous or Ingenious Little Livelihood Seekers. So the name itself really um, explains or represents what the social enterprise is. And we are a social and a cultural enterprise. We use business strategies to address social issues. And with Antil, it's primarily the lack of long-term economic opportunities and also cultural degradation. So in a nutshell, what we really do is provide sustainable livelihood to Filipino weaving um, and craft artisans across the country in order for us to be able to preserve our living traditions and reclaim our culture. I love it. And you know, as I was telling you, the first time I discovered the concept of a fashion, of a social enterprise was when I was living in the Philippines and coming from like an NGO and nonprofit background, I was so empowered to see that there is a business model that actually helps um, mission driven organizations, you know, be self sustainable and really an opportunity to create economic empowerment in different ways by having the DNA of the business really be committed to um, social and environmental preservation. So uh, I really love the work that you're doing and congratulations on all of your accomplishments so far uh, because I think what's special about Ant Hill too is that it's not only, um, you're not only doing good, but the products also look good. Uh, so that's really important, right? <laughs> Thank you for being a proud wee wearer all these years. <laughs> yes, yes, I love my weaves. So um, I want to start off because obviously our, our topic today is about collaborating with artisans. And there's a lot that goes into that. It's not as simple as, hey, I'm going to go find a group of artisans, contract them, and that's it, right? Okay. So what are some of, you know, maybe like the main factors that a brand or a company or a leader should consider when they're going to be going in to work with artisan communities? I think um, I, I can speak from our experience. I think it usually and it has to start from your intention, right? So Ant Hill spent a year, we spent a year, I spent a year um, traveling around the country and doing my research and my homework and really immersing myself in different um, indigenous communities and weaving communities to understand the realities they're in to understand also the state of um, the social issue and to really just kind of build relationships with the community. So it wasn't it wasn't like, okay, I saw a community that I want to support. I'm going to approach them and say, let's work together. It didn't work that way. It was a year long of um, investment in presence, which I think is the first uh, important n note to, to consider when you're going to want to work with artisans. But with Ant Hill, because we focus on weaving and craft artisans, um, we make sure that the artisans or the communities we work with first have a good leadership and governance structure. 
Mm. So we don't work with individual artisans. We work with community-based artisans. So they belong in villages or locally we call them barangays or towns mm. and villages. Yeah. And we need to know if there's a good leadership and governance structure, if there are um, certain leaders in the community that really have potential to influence uh, the other artisans in the community. Second, we also look at the level of their skill, right? Do we have the capacity to teach them new skills? Because that's really not what we want to do. We want to um, highlight and leverage on what they already know. We're not there to teach them new things. We want to showcase and put the spotlight on their talents and their skills. So we see their level of skill. Do we have master weavers, master crafters? Are they willing to teach younger women? Um, are their younger women interested to learn the craft from the elders? Mm. Uh, finally, we also look at their business readiness. Uh, are they willing to commit to certain um, partnership ag agreements or arrangements? Yeah. Are, they, are they willing to grow their business? So we look at that also. And finally, we make sure there's a market match because sometimes you can't just approach a community and then you know give them high hopes and then there's no market that's going to buy or support their livelihood. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so just to summarize the main points, right? So then you said that it would be presence and investment in the time to be able to actually spend with the communities. Um, you need to look for good governance so that the artisans are coming from a community space where there's already a structure and leadership. Um, you said that there was also um, a, 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 level a skill. level of skill. Uh, and then the, the the artisans also need to be willing to not only share their skill set, but also teach the skill set to younger generations. And then so business readiness. And then you said the last part was uh, market match. match. Yes. Okay. So those are very important factors to consider because I know that there are people out there who are very interested in this model, but don't know where to start and don't know how to do it correctly. So this is very helpful. Right. And sometimes like, you know, good intentions are really not enough. It's also good to kind of know what your resources are, what the resources available to you are. And then from there, kind of complement it with your strengths. Yes. And that uh, is a good way to kind of segue into my next question for you is that, as you said, good intentions aren't enough. A lot of things can, um, you know, not it could be good in theory, but maybe not so good in practice. So what are some of the challenges that you face on the field? And has there been anything that has surprised you? Uh, a lot of challenges. Um, first, of course, is, uh, you know, realizing that there's no cookie cutter solution or um, dynamic in terms of relationship that you can apply to all communities. Yeah. Um, the beauty of our work in Antil is we're able to really partner with indigenous, urban, and rural communities, and our relationships with them vary. So yeah. it so it only means one say for example strategy can probably work with our ip partner but it's not the case with our urban communities so we can't assume so i think one of the biggest learning is not to assume that everyone um kind of lives in the same context uh another challenge also we faced was the mindset mm -hmm. and um i'll talk more about this because i Later on, we realized it was really anchored on a lot of intergenerational trauma, but that um, victimhood mindset and how much they undervalue their own skill and their mm -hmm. own talent. And it, it took us a while to create a shift in how they perceive themselves and how they perceive um, their skill. So... Mm -hmm. It's also very difficult for them to, a lot of artisans find it very difficult to express themselves um, because they feel inferior. inferior. So mm -hmm. say for example, when you ask an artisan, how much is your per yard or how much is this piece of um, bracelet? They'll just say, it's up to you, ma'am. You can just price it yourself, whatever you feel like, how much you want to price it. So mm -hmm. that kind of sense of self-worth or how they're able to evaluate their product 
um, was a surprise in the sense that they didn't they did take pride of something that we feel is wicked, you know, like amazing, you know how to weave, right? So that's also another um, challenge. Yeah. Um, but finally, it's also the, the geographical challenge, like the communities being all over the Philippines. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more and unpack this intergenerational trauma because it's very interesting. And I think for people who may not be familiar, maybe can you give a little bit more context as to where that trauma comes from? And as a leader and as, a, as someone who also wants to empower them, how do you address that when you're in the field? Right. So, um, you know, as uh, the Philippines we have been colonized for 300 years by the Spaniards. And after that, um, uh, the Americans took over. Japan had a couple of years. So we had years and years of colonization. And really, that um, contributed to a lot of mentality that created trauma, unconscious trauma, I would say, to how Filipinos perceive themselves and how Filipinos perceive um, their talents and their skills. So what we, what I saw or what we see on the field um, from among the artisans are really the lack of um, sense of self-worth and the lack of like valuing what they're good at. So historically, we wear our weaves and our ancestors considered it their second skin. And I feel that's so beautiful, right? representing our identity and our heritage. When um, all these other, when we started getting colonized, there was a shift in terms of the use of our fabrics because we then started wearing import substitutes, you know, mm -hmm. and our fabrics, the use of our fabrics was um, downgraded, I would say, to just merely being used as upholstery or table runners, bed covers, and whatnot. And so a lot of Filipinos felt that why would I want to be like a walking table runner or a walking mm -hmm. mat? And in that sense, they felt like that was it, that we can't wear our clothes again. Yeah. We can't wear our weaves again. Um, also, there's a lot of like victimhood mindset. This is only what I can do. A lot of um, negative belief systems around that inferiority. A lot of mm -hmm. our weavers feel that if they can't speak English, for example, it means they're not smart or they're not mm -hmm. intelligent and it's not going to take them anywhere. They mm -hmm. always feel like working outside the country, um, you know, would bring them more wealth than being able to work at home and really um, investing their time and their energy in nurturing their own craft and talent. Yeah. Wow. And so as a leader, when you're out there trying to work with them, and of course you have the, the intention of wanting to empower them and also give them um, economic uh, means, right? And provision and to also honor their uh, talent through um, fair wages. So when you're um, on the field having to address these, these topics, like what is the way that you approach them? Yeah. So um, what we learned worked was when we go into the when we go into the when we go into the community and we establish our partnership with them we learn that language is so powerful there's such a huge power around the use of language and how it can shift narratives i mean you're a storyteller so you know this for sure and and even like the simplest vocabulary um, can create such a you know one 180 degree change in the way you you carry yourself the way you express yourself and the way you also perceive yourself so before um a lot of practitioners in community development would come to a community and do a needs assessment right mm -hmm. they usually they usually start the interaction or the um, profiling with what are your needs? What are your problems, right? So in Ant Hill, we uh, employ a different uh, strategy, or we 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 ask different questions. We use mm -hmm. um, assets assessment. So when we do our baselining and our profiling, we ask them, "What are your dreams? What are mm -hmm. you good at? Um, what do you want to achieve?" And just a tiny tweak in the way you ask questions 
creates a significant shift. So then they started to, to think and reflect on, yeah, what do I want to? Nobody's asked me that question. What mm. do I want to become? What do I want, what do I want to achieve? What am I proud of? You know, where am I good at? So suddenly they start thinking about um, themselves in a different light and not just really focusing on, ah, uh, you know, I'm the, the, this culture of mendicancy, like, you know, I'm so poor, I have nothing, I don't have any resources here, I probably will never be successful, mm -hmm. I will never receive abundance. So that's, to me, that's, to us, that's really key, that mm -hmm. just shift in, in um, the way you ask questions. But second mm -hmm. is, we let our partners tell their stories. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that alone shifts the agency to it reminds them that they have power that they aren't um, again, like kind of shifting that victimhood mentality into something that wait a second, I'm the hero here also like what are the things that I want to accomplish in my life. And so that's just a, such a wonderful anecdote to really shift the conversation to then give them more power. So thank you. Anna. That's really helpful. Um, and then how do you then uh, decide on fair living wages for artisans? Because I think, you know, of course, like if you're a company or a brand and you're coming from a different country and wanting to do business, right? Like what are the ways that um, they can assess what's fair and what isn't um, as they also observe the local context and local life? So first is we look at um, what is the daily minimum wage in this municipality where they belong and then we do a time and motion of um the, their production so if say you're weaving how long does it take you to weave a meter or if you're creating crafts like bags and whatnot then how, how many bags or how many bracelets are you able to finish in a day and then we compute based on their daily minimum wage so a lot of the artisans, when we um, came into partnership with them, really don't know how to properly cost their products. And that's why they're not able to sustain their businesses and save. So the, the, the teaching of teaching them how to properly cost their products and properly pricing is something that's very um, that's imperative and it's one of the first courses we have in our program um, also then when we decide on a, when we decide on a price point we have to make sure that the artisans agree like it's some there's some mutual agreement there's also a lot of transparency that we practice with the artisans so say for example we're going to um, procure a weave a weave from them at this price they know that this is how much we're going to sell it in the market so that they they also understand like why we we set these margins why they have to set these margins and what happens to these margins so for mm -hmm. Antil example we reinvest 80 percent of our margins back to the program to ensure that they're able to actually gain skills from our capacity building and become self-reliant one day I mean, our goal is to be obsolete and mm -hmm. then to have these communities run their enterprises on their own yeah, so a couple follow up questions to that, because obviously you mentioned that you also take note of the daily minimum wage, but then there's also this concept of a living wage, right? So do you kind of offset and also maybe explaining the difference like between a minimum wage and a living wage and how you might address that as you try to figure out a good price point? Right. So, I mean, the daily minimum wage, um, to be honest, I don't know how the government uh, decides what the daily minimum wages. So that is just the baseline for us because the living wage, of course, is kind of what uh, you look at when you look at the quality of life of an artisan or the well-being of an artisan. And when when we work on pricing with a community, we also look at, we anchor that back to what they want to achieve and what their goals are so when an artisan talks about oh i want to be able to uh, save for an educational plan for my child or i want to be able to improve my home i want to be able to invest in a pig uh, so i can have other sources of income mm -hmm. then 
then definitely that also increases um, their living wage. So, so we always challenged artisans to think about what they want to achieve and from there kind of learn how to value their skill and talent. Yeah. Um, and also another thing is um, the concept of a design fee. A lot of artisans don't think of themselves as designers. They think of them as laborers. That's how they call themselves. I do only labor lang, ma'am. So we challenge them to also own their creativity um, and incorporate that in their pricing or their costing because it's their creative talent, it's their creative mind invested in making weaves that are so intricate. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's so important to really differentiate and and um, have the distinction between a minimum wage and a living wage, because I think obviously a lot of brands and companies, they just want to be it's just being compliant. Uh, yeah. But being compliant isn't exactly enough, right? Because if you're trying to lift people out of the cycle of poverty, you need more than the minimum wage. You, As you said, you need to be able to provide for them to act to, to have the kind of income that will allow them to grow and thrive and right. actually advance. Um, and what's I think so unique is that you have a program. So as a company, can you share a little bit more about what this program is? Um, because it's not just you're training them in skills, you're actually giving them life skills as well. Thank you, Ruby. Um, so we developed this program also in partnership with our artisans. It wasn't something that you know, we just did on our own. It's a lot of, um, you know, trial and error. And we had one community, which is our first community in Abra, North Luzon of the Philippines, one of the islands of the Philippines, that became our kind of, um, you know, co-creator, co-designer in this program. So we call it our Community Enterprise Development Program. And we have five courses in this program. And this also um, kind of, influences or informs our level of interaction in our communities. So first is cultural appreciation. And this mm -hmm. is really deepening the understanding and appreciation of what it means to learn how to weave, what it means to have a legacy passed on to you by your great grandmother, your mother, your grandmother, your mother-in-law. And why is it important to pass it on to the younger women? So mm -hmm. primarily this targets um, younger women or younger generation of weavers and artisans because a lot of them don't really see the relevance and the value of learning the craft. As I said earlier, because of colonial mentality, a lot of them prefer to say work in the city or work abroad and don't feel a strong affinity to the community. So this is, this is addressing that gap. It strengthens their why and it goes beyond just weaving so it can put food on the table which i think is foundational and very important second is when we do product design and innovation so that's kind of our second level of interven intervention because most of the if not all of our partner artisan communities already have existing skills that they that they know how to do so mm -hmm. we just come in to help them um, elevate these skills so basic, basic training, like how to make a mood board. What are what are the what are the colors of the season, so that they can be informed on like proper color combination when when they do a warp of a weave. So for example, say now a lot of our artisans, when we ask them to weave blue, they say, "Mom, what kind of blue? Navy blue, teal blue." So they already have a variety. And then we also have business skills transfer, which I said involves um, proper costing, inventory management, supply chain management, quality control. And then fourth is a master and apprentice program. And this is also one of our flagship program. We incentivize our master weavers and augment their income by 20% with a condition that they teach a younger weaver. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, financial literacy and savings program, because a lot of these women artisans are have a lot of debt and they're not really able to kind of manage their finances very well. Yeah. And speaking of finances, right, it's also about formalizing their um, economic contributions. A lot of times in cottage industries where people are getting paid by cash. Uh, yeah. Perhaps sometimes it's a little bit difficult to then formalize some of their economic um, uh, savings or economic uh, 
earnings or so. even like government benefits like you know they don't know because they're not like um in uh in a proper like company right so uh they don't know that they have the capacity to contribute for their benefits themselves so yeah. now like our, our artisans have their own bank accounts they have access to loans and insurance yeah. um, so yeah it's something that also supports what uh can contribute to a, a really um ethical or a, a, a fair living wage yes and so i i just think it's so fantastic because not only are you creating these products and creating these community collaborations but it's really a social innovation project um and really um investing in the longevity of this community and really passing down the new the traditions through their lineage so it's really awesome work um, as a leader what are some of your main pieces of advice uh for people who want to start companies like yours, you know, if they want to work into, if they want to go into communities, um, what are the things that they need to keep in mind in order to not only create an ethical uh, supply chain, but also to make sure that they're always coming from a lens of cultural respect and appreciation versus appropriation? Right. Um, I think I will reiterate what I mentioned earlier. I think first, first and foremost, you have to invest time in presence in really getting to know your partners um, and that and that will take a long time and that's okay um, also when you are in the community um, don't come with a know-it-all hat I think it's important that we come with an empty cup and we just kind of learn uh, as we actively listen to what they have to share and their stories uh, also, second is that exercise of appreciative inquiry in asking the right questions yeah. and not questions that will um, make them feel uh, worse, like be sensitive in the kind of questions we ask. Maybe ask questions that will empower them to realize their full potential. Also, uh, last is engage in participatory communication. Um, it's important that we turn over the microphones to them and let them own their stories and, you know, share these stories with pride. Um, and yeah, as you said earlier, it's just really, all of this is really founded around listening and active, um, authentic listening. Yeah. And speaking of storytelling, um, a lot of brands have tried to attempt to do these kinds of collaborations, but when they actually promote the uh, product or when they promote the collaboration, they get a lot of backlash because it actually comes off as cultural appropriation. Now, seeing as someone who has a master's in communications for social change, what are some of your storytelling guidelines to make sure that these stories are coming from a place of uh, respect? Um, I think that's the first one. I think really for you to be able, it's not it's not a question of doing things right, but for you to be able to um, hold space for their stories, you have to have a clarity of intention, right? And you have to really have so much respect for their own stories and their voice. Yeah. So that's first. I think, you know, um, be very genuine and reflective discerning about why it's important for you as a brand to hold space for them for these artisans and these communities and why it's important for you to share their stories and also kind of know your place know your place you are an enable enabler you it's a privilege for you for us you're, a guest. you're a guest in their home yeah <laughs> Exactly. It's a privilege for you to be able to share these stories. It's a privilege for you that they allowed you to and they welcomed you in their home. Right. So um, how do you, and then the, the third question is, how then do you share the story with respect and integrity? Um, and the I guess to to go back to the basics, it's very important for brands to acknowledge who made uh, your clothes or who made these crafts, um, how it's made, like, talk about the process, talk about the intricacies, honor the pace, honor the slowness in production, um, and 
or also honor their place of origin. Uh, I think Fashion Revolution got it right when when they pointed out uh, these very important questions to, to ask. Right. Yes. Thank you, Anya. I, we have learned so much from you and your expertise, and I hope that this inspires other social entrepreneurs, especially in the fashion space. Um, where can other people find your work so that they can see what you do and learn more? You can check out our um, website, uh, anthillfabricgallery.com, and you can also follow us on Instagram at anthillfabric, like us on Facebook, Anthill Fabric Gallery. Awesome. Well, thank you, Anya, for being a guest on the show and sharing your knowledge. And for those of you watching, I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. And if it inspired you, share it with a friend. Uh, here at Grit and Glamour, we recognize that there is a messiness to the process. So even though it looks very shiny on the outside, there is a lot of hard work. And as we've learned from Anya, there's a lot of work and investment that goes into this type of company. So to learn more and to tune in to the next one, st stay tuned here every Saturday. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.